Now I really love the Harry Potter series. Ever since the day back in 2002 when I watched the first movie on DVD and it instantly captured my imagination. After that I saw every other movie in theaters, read the books, played some of the video games. I adore this series. The world JK Rowling was able to create is one of the most rich, detailed, and dare I say, magical I have ever read. And the film franchise was not only an excellent series, but a unique experience. Being able to grow up along with these actors holds this series close to my heart. But that doesn't mean they're perfect. If you saw Cinemassacre's dumbest Indiana Jones moments and Nostalgia Critic's dumbest Superman, Spider-Man, and Lord of the Rings moments, that's kinda what I'm doing here. Obviously these books are pretty detailed and got so massive that they had to simplify some stuff. But some moments just make fans and non-fans scratch their heads in confusion. Now I'm using moments in a broad term, some of these are aspects that spawn the entire movie and a couple span the whole series. But before I get comments, I'm only judging by what they do have, not what they don't have. So if you came here to see me complain about how they left out the Marauders backstory or didn't have Jenny and Harry kiss in the common room, well, you're out of luck. Now don't get me wrong, if the books did it better, then I'll of course compare the two, or if it's a moment in the books that they didn't explain well enough in the movies that non-book readers will be confused, that counts as well. After all, these should stand on their own. But I'm not just gonna sit here and bitch they didn't have something. And just to be fair, I have one example from each movie and two of them that span the whole series. So I won't just be filling this list with moments from Order of the Phoenix. Oh, and there are going to be a lot of spoilers. Like, a lot of spoilers. In fact, number 10 is probably the biggest spoiler in the whole series. So if you haven't seen the movies yet, come back after you're done. Have a marathon, those are always fun. So let's get into this. These are the top 10 worst Harry Potter movie moments. Number 10. Voldemort's Demise from Deathly Hallows Part 2. Told you there were going to be spoilers. Now I've heard people complain about them taking the dialogue heavy final battle from the book and turning it into a special effects heavy action scene. I don't mind that because while six minutes of dialogue may work in a book, in a movie, especially one that's the finale of a franchise that has been going on for 10 years, it would be a bit of an anti-climax. I find it weird that the people I know who have read the book think it's too much, but the people who haven't read the book think it's too little. It's curious, don't you think? No, I actually like the end battle. You got Voldemort fucking attacking Harry, and then Harry grabs him around the neck and they jump off the ledge. Then they're flying around and shit, they land on the ground, both crawl to their wands, Harry throws Expelliarmus, Voldemort throws a Vada Kedavra, and while all that's going on, Neville gets the sword of Gryffindor and cuts off Nagini's head, destroying the last Horcrux. And then the two throw their spells one last time, the Elder Wand leaps from Voldemort's hands, Harry catches it, and then... Fuck is that? So Voldemort was made out of paper this whole time? I did not realize that. Actually, I'm willing to accept this because I see what they're going for. They're symbolizing that he tore his soul up so much that he was basically an empty shell of a man. Also, they can get more money out of the 3D. Now, while I do personally prefer the mundaneness of his death in the book, I'm fine with this artistic decision. What I find most baffling about this scene is this. Uh, no. No, you can't just cut to the aftermath of that. Last time we saw these guys, they were on a battle. No one was around when that happened. What the hell did Harry say to them? Guys, guys, I I, I got him. I, hey, everybody, I, I, I got him. What? I, I, I killed Voldemort. Well, that's fantastic, Harry. Um, uh, where's the body? Um, w w well, th there is no body. What? Well, well, I cast Expelliarmus, and he cast Avada Kedavra, and our wands did that wand connecting thing, and then he sort of turned into confetti and flew away. It's true! Well, it may have made for a huge climax, and I'm sure if you saw it in 3D, it looked really cool. But would it have really cost that much more to film an alternate ending for those outside the 3D theaters? I mean, come on, be a little considerate. 
just a flesh wound. Number 9. Detention in the Forbidden Forest from Sorcerer's Stone. Now I said that I wouldn't put something here that was in the book and wasn't in the movie, but if a moment from the movie was in the book and it was stupid in the book, then it still counts. There's a reason that people who haven't read the books think that Hogwarts is one of the worst schools in fiction and it's because of shit like this. So Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Draco all were caught out of the common room after hours. Obviously they should be punished to learn that that is a really dangerous thing to do. So what should we do with them? Send them into the Forbidden Forest in the middle of the night with dozens of dangerous creatures and only a half a year of spell knowledge to protect them. Obviously! We can't go in there. Students aren't allowed. Well, I guess they do have Hagrid. Ron, Hermione, you'll come with me. And Harry, you'll go with Malfoy. You really suck at this, don't you, Hagrid? Okay, then I get Fang. Fine. Yeah, all right, I guess that's something. Just so you know, he's a bloody coward. No, you know who's really to blame here? Dumbledore. He's the one running this shit, he's responsible for these students, and he's sending first years into a place called the Forbidden Forest? You are an awful headmaster. Don't give me that grin. Was it uh, on detention would find you hanging by your thumbs in the dungeons? Actually, that sounds better. Sure, your thumbs may pop out, but I'm sure Madame Pomfrey can fix that up overnight. Even she can't cure death. And what ends up happening after the group splits up? Yeah, you realize if that centaur didn't show up, Harry would be dead, right? First years, please note that the Dark Forest is strictly forbidden to all students. Unless you break our rules, in which case, death! Well, what more can I say? The safety precautions at Hogwarts have always been a joke, but with something like this, you'd think one parent would come forward and say, what the fuck is wrong with you? Oh, there's more than werewolves in those trees, lad. Number 8. When is this set? This may surprise you, and it certainly surprised me, but the Harry Potter books are actually set in the 90s. Harry started Hogwarts in September 1991, and the Battle of Hogwarts happened in May 1998. Which is kind of funny when you think about it. That means when Harry and Hermione went to Godric's Hollow and they were attacked by Nagini, people were flocking to see Titanic. That means while Harry was learning from the Half-Blood Prince, muggles were jamming to the Macarena. The books are pretty consistent when it comes to the time period, but the movies, yeah, they're basically stuck in a time vortex. The most obvious example of this not being set in the 90s is in Half-Blood Prince when the Death Eaters destroy the Millennium Bridge, despite that not opening until 2000. The cars that the Dursleys have in 1991 wouldn't exist until 1995. There's a bunch of little inconsistencies like that, but maybe they just boosted up the movies 10 years. Nope! In Deathly Hallows, when Harry and Hermione are in Godric's Hollow, the dates on his parents' graves say they died in 1981. So, this series is still set in the 90s. Anytime we see the Muggle world, it always feels like a place out of time. Sometimes it looks like the 60s, sometimes it looks like the 2000s. Yeah, it's a bit inconsistent, but it doesn't really hurt the movies that much, so that's why it's so low on the list. And really, that's all I got. Next number. Awful things happen to wizards who meddle with time, Harry. Number 7. Ron in Prisoner of Azkaban. Any fan of the books will tell you that Ron got seriously shafted in the movies, but most of the films did make sure to give him at least one badass moment of awesome. All except for Prisoner of Azkaban. What exactly did Ron do in this movie? Well, he did do an adequate job casting the ridiculous spell, I guess, but so did one of the Batil twins, although to be fair, she made it a fuck ton creepier. <laughs> and, um, uh, he did give Harry that pocket sneakoscope that. Uh, oh, oh, wait, that was deleted from the final film. Um, yeah, that's it. He did nothing else of value in this movie. They even gave his defense of Harry line to Hermione. If you want to kill Harry, you'll have to kill us too. But it's not just the fact that he's useless that makes him have no point, it's also the fact that he is a whiner. Almost every scene he's in has him cowering in fear or getting angry at someone. Looks more like a pig with hair if you ask me. There's something moving out there. I haven't lost anything. Your cat killed him. Do you know everything? <laughs> Next time I see Crookshanks, I'll let him know. You almost tore my leg off. How is it she knows everything? They want me to tap dance. I don't want to tap dance. Harry, I'm highly run! Bloody hell, Harry. <laughs> that was not funny. Stop it. Stop it. 
He's so useless that Hermione doesn't even want him to take part in the climax. Sorry, Ron, but seeing as you can't walk. Yeah, Ron, just stay here. We, we just, uh... Just stay here. Well, Ron may have usually been screwed by adaptation, but this is the only time you can ask, why the hell are they friends with him? What the bloody hell was that all about? Number six. The Look of Half-Blood Prince I personally think Half-Blood Prince is the most underrated movie in the series. It gets a lot of shit, but I personally find it to be pretty great. Although the book is my least favorite, so it may have been lowered expectations. Anyway, why the hell does this movie look like this? Don't get me wrong, from a cinematography and effects standpoint, this movie looks fantastic. I'm talking about the color and the lighting. I know the series got darker as it went along, but this may as well be a black and white movie, the colors are so muted. My original thought was that the movie was made to have a green tint to it, much like how Order of the Phoenix had a blue tint, that way they can match the American book covers, but obviously that's not true, mostly because the entire cast and crew are from England. But it turns out, according to an interview with David Yates he did before the release of the film, it's actually inspired by Rememberant. Alright, fair enough, but what does Rememberant have to do with Harry Potter? And while well, that may work in a painting, when you try to copy that in a film it just looks weird. Not only is there just barely any color, but some scenes are so dark that you can barely tell what's going on. Now I personally get used to it every time I watch it, and there are parts where it can look pretty cool, but let's just be glad they got rid of that before they got into Deathly Hollows. It's a nice idea, but it just didn't pan out right. The picture is fuzzy! Number 5 the ending of Chamber of Secrets. I absolutely adore the Chamber of Secrets film. It's not only my favorite Harry Potter movie, but one of my favorite movies of all time. And that's why it stings me so much that the ending is such a what the fuck. And I mean the end end, not the climax, not even the couple of scenes that come right after that. I mean right after Hermione returns. As soon as she finishes hugging Harry, I usually just shut the movie off. There's no reason to watch it. The movie's over, but for some reason it just continues for another five minutes. I mean, it starts out harmless enough, they just clap for Madame Pomfrey and Madame Sprout for helping the people who were petrified. Whatever, I could have guessed that by the fact that Hermione and Nick were fine. By the way, how the hell did they cure Nick? He's a ghost! Also, in light of the recent events, as a school treat, all exams have been cancelled. And for all you 5th and 7th years who needed those exams to help you get a career, tough shit. Although I will say Hermione's reaction here is really funny. Some more applause, and then Hagrid comes back. Again, we didn't really need to see that, I kinda just assumed he would be freed. But whatever, all the loose ends are tied up. Just end. There's no Hogwarts without you, Hagrid. <laughs> Yeah, that's the main problem with this ending. It's really cheesy. And I like some cheese, but this is pushing it. This is pushing it to the edge. After that, they all give him a round of applause. Why? He didn't do anything. Is he getting this treatment because he didn't try to kill anyone? Was this supposed to be Hagrid's movie all along? And it just goes on and on and on. At least Return of the King did stuff with its endings. Oh god, riff tracks, make this ending more bearable, please. And so they cheered into the night and on to the next morning until finally their muscles sore, their energy depleted, the hydration set in. Death came swiftly then until the dining hall became one huge mausoleum. An area of one quarter mile in every direction was sealed off, and the ghastly process of identifying and removing the bodies went on for months. It was magic. Number four. The first 11 minutes of Order of the Phoenix. I have some serious issues with Order of the Phoenix as a fan of the books given that they took out most of Neville's character arc, but even ignoring the omissions, this movie still gets off to a really rocky start. And I think the best way to explain it is to go through it scene by scene. We open in Little Whinging with short-haired Harry sitting on a swing at the playground in the middle of nowhere. He's having nightmares about Cedric's death when Dudley and his group of hooligan friends that I didn't know he had start taunting him. Eventually Harry gets fed up and points the wand at Dudley in Dark Clouds cover the sky. So the two run from the wild shaky can of doom and hide in a tunnel where- ah! Ah! 
Okay, I just learned that Dementors are only scary when they have their hoods on because that looks absolutely ridiculous. It looks like a mummy. They start sucking the happiness from them and then Harry takes out his wand and... No. No. No, 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 no! You can't stun a Dementor. You can only use Expecto Patronum. What you just saw was basically like hitting smoke with a baseball bat. And this isn't me speaking as someone who's read the books. This was already established in the movies. Patronus is a kind of positive force, and for the wizard who can conjure one, it works something like a shield with a Dementor feeding on it rather than him. But Harry manages to drive them off as someone comes to help. Mrs. Fig. Who? Okay. I know who this character is because I've read the first book, but if you haven't read the first book, then this character just comes out of nowhere. We don't even get a backstory. She takes them home where we see Mr. and Mrs. Dursley, and I have to ask something. Are these two high? Is that you? Dudleykins, why is your head a cheeseburger? I know the Dursleys were always comedically exaggerated, but they were never this much of a joke. An owl flies in and crashes, I'm guessing the Weasleys lend an arrow to the Ministry because that's who this letter is from, or maybe it's just a stupid joke, I don't know. This terrible CGI effect tells Harry he has been expelled and so the Dursleys take Dudley to the hospital. Later, the Order of the Phoenix arrives to rip off lines from Chamber of Secrets. Professor Moody, what are you doing here? Rescuing you, of course. They go outside where they give us some bad exposition. Not here, Nymphadora. Don't call me Nymphadora. So, how are they gonna get him to number 12 Grimwald Place? By flying. Yep, take the kid who was just expelled for using magic and have him use magic to leave. And they aren't even being conspicuous. They're basically trying to get muggles to see them. If you're not gonna even try to camouflage him, at least stay up high. Oh, and this scene also looks like shit. Hi everybody, we're on a green screen effect that hasn't been this bad since Sorcerer's Stone. So they open up number 12 Grimwald Place, I love that Harry is still mesmerized by this shit. And this is when the movie finally starts to get good. This 11 minutes pretty much contains all the main problems of the series. Blatant disregard for continuity? Check. Dumbing down the characters for comedy? Check. Trying to explain 10 different plot points in 10 seconds because we didn't know they were going to be important when we left them out of the earlier movies? Check. Well, actually not check, they didn't even try with that. One. Now, don't get me wrong, Order of the Phoenix has some brilliant moments and some of the best casting decisions in the movies, but whenever someone tries to tell me the Half-Blood Prince is worse, I always remind them of the opening of Order of the Phoenix. Justice. Number 3. The acting in Goblet of Fire. Say what you will about Goblet of Fire, you can't deny its epicness. Everything about this movie is just big. Big sets, big effects, big action, and really big, really over-the-top acting. This is most obvious in Brendan Gleeson's portrayal of Mad-Eye Moody. I think this character was supposed to be creepy, but every time he's on screen, I just laugh. I get that he was supposed to be a little loopy, but how did no one know this wasn't the real Mad-Eye? Especially when we see him later at both the end of this movie and in later movies when he talks and acts like an odd but still relatively normal person. The other weird performance I think of is Roger Lloyd Pack as Barty Crouch Sr. For those who don't know, he's basically a combination of two characters from the book, Barty Crouch Sr. and Ludo Bagman. And I have absolutely no idea what kind of performance he's going for. I think he's supposed to be a broken man after what happened with his son, but what I get is some guy who really does not want to be there. Champions in a circle around me. Miss Delacour, over here. Mr. Crumb. And, uh, Potter, Mr. Potter, over here. That's right. Now. Yes, yes, uh, here's your dragon, uh, your dragon, uh, your dragon, your dragon, bye! But it's not just the new actors, the returning actors also seem to have gotten an upgrade, and by that I mean they mostly just shout. And I'm not sure about the younger actors, but they seem to have been directed to act like teenagers, but because they were told to act like teenagers, they tried to talk like teenagers, but in the end just sound like people trying to act like teenagers. Besides, I can take care of myself. Doubt it. He's way too old. What? What? That's what you think? Yeah, that's what I think. You know the solution then, don't you? Go on. Next time there's a ball, pluck up the courage and ask me before somebody else does. And not as a last resort. But all that is small fry compared to the most infamous moment in the entire series. Harry, you put your name in the cupboard of the fire. Closer. 
Did you ask one of the older students to do it for you? No, sir. You're absolutely sure? Yes, yes sir. This is probably the most ridiculed moment in the movies because how out of character it is for Dumbledore. Even taking the books out of it, Dumbledore is always calm, cool, and collected. He would never go crazy over something as minuscule as Harry possibly cheating. And sadly, Michael Gambon's whole portrayal of Dumbledore is often ruined in most people's eyes because of this one scene, which I don't think is fair. I, for one, think he did a good job in all the other movies, and this scene is more an outcome of bad directing than bad acting. What more can I say? When Robert Pattinson gives the best, most down to earth performance in your movie, maybe you should take it down a little. Harry, you put your name in the cupboard of the fire. Oh, Don't you fucking lie to me, Harry! <laughs> Number two. This scene from Deathly Hallows Part 1. Uh. Fuck. I know I said I wouldn't put something in here just because it was different from the books, and believe me, this scene would suck no matter what, but I just want to tell you how this happened in the book. Pettigrew comes down and starts to strangle Harry with the hand that Voldemort gave him. Harry reminded him that he saved Pettigrew's life back at the Shrieking Shack. Pettigrew loosens his grip just a little bit, and the hand senses this is a sign of betrayal, turned on its owner, and strangled him to death. Alright, I get that that death may be a little much for a PG-13 movie, but did you have to turn it into a joke? Oh, and don't tell me he didn't die from this, because we never see him again. I don't know how you die from a stun to the back of the head, maybe he cracked his skull open on the floor, but still, that one ounce of humanity and just loosening his grip a little showed so much. Remember, Pettigrew was Harry's dad's friend, and to see him go out like this, it just feels insulting. This series had to change a lot, and normally I'm fine with it, but even just looking at this as just a sequel, this is the only part of the Harry Potter series to legit piss me off. Uh. <laughs> Number one. Continuity. Yeah, you could say a lot about the Harry Potter movies, but you can't say they have good continuity between each film. In fact, the only consistent thing about the Harry Potter movies is their lack of consistency. Makes sense when you take into account they went through four different directors and ten years of technology change. There are plenty to find, but I'm just gonna show you some of my favorites. Well, let's see, most locations look completely different between each film. Hagrid's hut seems to go on from a straight path towards down a hill. A giant clock and bridge just seem to appear in Poison of Azkaban. The courtyard grows in size for the final battle. Harry somehow doesn't see the Thestrals into Order of the Phoenix despite seeing Quirrell die in Sorcerer's Stone. The Polyjuice Potion doesn't change her voice in Chamber of Secrets, but then does in Goblet of Fire, but then doesn't again in Deathly Hallows. The Fat Lady completely changes personalities, and her location goes from the end of a long hallway to the top of a staircase. Speaking of which, those staircases seem to give up trying to move by the final few movies, didn't they? Apparition sometimes is just just appearing out of nowhere and other times gives you a magical fog effect. Fire communication is different in Goblet of Fire in Order of the Phoenix. Expelliarmus sometimes disarms your opponent and sometimes shoots them back. Avada Kedavra mostly kills people instantly, except for Sirius, who has time to look at Harry and fall back into the veil. Harry can't do magic while underage, except for casting Lumos at the beginning of the third movie. Oh, and Lavender Brown changed race. And that's all just a small drop in the bucket. And before any of you leave, any nasty comments, remember, you can't really love something unless you're willing to mock it for all it's worth. And I do really love this series. Getting to grow up along with these characters and learn stuff along with them, I would not trade that experience for the world. Besides that, all of these movies were extremely entertaining. The action, the adventure, the mystery, the comedy, the music, the stories, the magic. It's all just so wonderful. I still have memories of seeing Sorcerer's Stone for the first time on DVD, or going with my cousins to see Goblet of Fire, and going to the midnight screening of the last movie with my dad. And really, that's what the Harry Potter movies are for me. Despite all their problems, they're more than just movies. They're memories. Memories that will last forever.